So good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's PestFacts WA Plant Disease Webinar. My name is Cindy Webster, and I am the PestFacts WA Newsletter Editor and Project Lead, and I'm hosting the webinar today. So this webinar has been funded by DPIRD and GIDC as part of the RPM for Greens project that is mentioned on the screen. And Jeff, if you'd just like to move us on to today's agenda. So first off, we have um, DPIRD Senior Research Scientist, Jeff Thomas, and he's going to be talking to us about DPED's main folio disease findings from their surveillance in 2021, and what broadacre crop diseases growers need to look, watch out for this season. We'll then move on to Kira Beard, another research scientist at DPED, and Kira's going to be talking about sclerotinia and what to look out for and how to manage it this season. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, so please use the Q&A tool or the chat function to ask any questions and our presenters will be hanging around after the webinar to answer those. And please be aware that we'll be keeping all attendees muted just to try and increase the sound quality of this webinar. But the webinar recording and the PowerPoint slides will be made available to everyone afterwards. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Jeff to start today's webinar. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, today I'm going to be speaking about, good morning everybody and welcome along. I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, some work that we do as part of a deeper GRDC um, project, a surveillance and diagnostics project for the grains industry, and it involves basically everybody within our deeper pathology group uh, that are ranged across, across the wheat belt. Specifically, I'm going to be referring to some work that we do. It's a spring survey. Um, so every year we go out into paddocks in the spring period and and look for, you know, look at 20 or 30 plants in a, in a, in a, in a paddock and assess what diseases are present and, and sort of the severity of those diseases. And that you can see on that map the, the range of, of regions in which we covered, and that's basically covering all the major crop types. So what did we see in 2021? Um, well, as in most years, and if you've attended these webinars in the past, the, the, these numbers aren't going to be a lot different. Um, Stubble-borne diseases were the most common diseases that we saw, not necessarily the most damaging necessarily, but certainly the most common. So spot form net blotch uh, in barley, you know, 78, 80% of paddocks had measurable levels of spot form. And if you're in the Quinana zone, every paddock that we went into had spot form net blotch. Um, not really that surprising, I guess, given, given the um, variety spectrum, the susceptibility of our varieties and the... Um, and the, you know, the commonality of, of uh, barley uh, within particularly that Kunana zone or barley on barley or barley um, in, the, in the program. Um, we might expect that to change over a little bit over time as, as our variety spectrum changes a bit to some, some varieties with slightly improved um, uh, resistance. In wheat, yellow spot and odorum blotch, again, 90% of paddocks had some measurable level of these diseases, but generally speaking at lowish uh, severity. Um, and that's not to be unexpected, I guess, because our, again, our variety spectrum is uh, in the, on the better end for those diseases. So a majority of our varieties are MS or MRMS for yellow spot and, and sort of MS or better for, for nodorum. And so whilst those diseases are present, they're probably not as damaging uh, in the current uh, uh, spectrum. Um, certainly it would, the, uh, the severity of disease was probably greatest in the Geraldton zone last year. And we did see some gloom blotch um, in the in the Geraldton and, and Esperance regions, probably some of those early sown crops, um, uh, they've got some gloom blotch. In oats, just about every paddock you go to into has got some septoria. Um, again, in it's most damaging in those uh, sort of higher rainfall western regions of the of the Quinana zone. I guess those oat heartland. Um, but again, it's uh, as a stubble-borne disease, it's it's present every year, and then. Um, probably the other major stubble-borne disease is black leg and canola and, and sort of 40 to 50% of paddocks that we went into had some expression of black leg last year, either stem canker or foliar symptoms or upper canopy infection. Kira is going to be talking about sclerotinia a bit more in detail, but certainly scler sclerotinia was common in canola and lupin last year. Um, about 50% of paddocks uh, had... Uh, of canola paddocks had sclerotinia last year and, and sort of 40% of lupin paddocks, certainly that Geraldton or sort of north of the Great Eastern Highway, medium and high rainfall zone is the, is the sort of uh, area of greatest impact. And certainly in Geraldton, 100% of uh, paddocks reported 
Um, canola paddocks reported had some degree of uh, sclerotinia and 75% of lupin paddocks. So certainly that northern ag region is um, is uh, area of high impact for sclerotinia. But I'll leave that there for, for Kira to cover further. Last year was a bit of a green bridge year. Certainly there was good rainfall. And, and if you can hear a bit of uh, noise out here, it's, it's rain on my tin roof at the moment. But uh, last year certainly was a green bridge year and, and, and um, we saw um, early, early uh, emerging wild oats and throughout the season, any, any time we stopped on the side of the road to look at wild oats, they certainly had leaf rust on them. And that was reflected in the fact that probably 35% of oat crops that we visited last season, particularly in that Quinana zone, had leaf rust in them. And that's certainly more than has been seen in previous seasons, reflecting that, that, uh, that green bridge scenario um, and a little bit of stem rust. And certainly I'm aware of several crops that needed some um, control for stem rust last year. For the first time since about 2015, we saw stripe rusting crops last year out uh, in the uh, east of Meriden, Meriden and East and down towards Narrambeen. Um, late report, so in October, but the classic Greenbridge scenario. This was the, dub, the old WA pathotype, so it wasn't a re-incursion, it was a re-establishment of the old infection. Um, classic Greenbridge scenario, regrowth of those susceptible varieties and then a cropping of those susceptible varieties, meaning that we got this localised um, occurrence of, of stripe rust. Whether or not that continues into this, that's a problem for this year, um, may or may not be, but certainly an indication that whilst we, have, we aren't seeing those rust diseases, they are bubbling away at very low levels under the surface. And if we get the, the conditions of a green bridge and a susceptible variety, we can see them um, build up. In Greenbridge years, um, certainly virus diseases are, can be an issue with early germination of, of infected host material in, in B1 in, and, um, and build up of, of vectors. And so we saw quite a bit of being yellow mosaic virus in Lupin last year with about 30% of paddocks, particularly in those um, Western and Southern uh, Lupin growing areas where there's plenty of that uh, subclover, which is a seed borne host of BYMV. Um, so that was a disease that we, saw plenty of last year. Um, I guess the winter of last year was quite wet and we saw quite big, dank, uh, heavy canopies, perfect conditions for, for, for um, diseases like uh, Botrytis diseases and certainly um, Faber beans across the South Coast. Every paddock that went into had, had chocolate spot last year and that is a disease that um, will continue to need to be uh, monitored and controlled in Faber beans. And Botrytis grey mould, um, uh, lentils, uh, chickpeas had Botrytis grain of, of interest was the fact that some of those southern lupin crops actually had uh, had Botrytis grey mould in them last year and, and in down around some crops that we, we monitored down around that sort of cogent up uh, uh, Stirlings region, um, there was probably more BGM than sclerotinia in lupin crops last year. So if we come out of last year, that's a very brief snapshot of last year. If we come out of last year and we, we come through the summer, what do we see? Well, um, certainly sort of December, January, February, hot and dry. What does that mean? Well, probably that means that we saw, you know, not much green material surviving. Um, and a lot of the stubble is just sitting there, um, not changing uh, due to that hot weather. Um, we moved into March and we did start to see some some rainfall occurring, particularly up in that um, sort of north eastern uh, region, and certainly that resulted in some, some green uh, germination, some good soil moisture in some regions. And now, as we move into as we've moved into April, we've seen much more widespread um, rainfall. Um, not all areas, and Cindy was just telling me how dry it's been around her area in Narragin, um, but certainly much more widespread uh, uh, rainfall and soil moisture, providing some significant early sowing opportunities. And, and I'm aware of many, many uh, canola programs that are over and done, and uh, certainly some that were, were done by Easter. So certainly there's been a number of early sowing opportunities. And that'll have implications both for um, sowing time of crops, uh, maturation of spores on stubble, and development of some early uh, volunteer regrowth. I'm gonna spend just a few minutes um, talking about a couple of specific issues 
that came out of last year that would be probably worth looking at uh, coming into this season. So in oats, in previous, in previous uh, presentations, you've heard me talk about the risk associated with the, the fact that we think that there may be red leather leaf uh, in oats in Western Australia. So last year, we were able to confirm the first confirmed record of this disease in Western Australia. So the first confirmed detection of red leather leaf in oats in Western Australia. Um, we were specifically looking for this disease. It's a fungal disease um, that, that impacts on oats. And we, we found three positive samples last year. I'm sure there's more out there, but we certainly three positive samples from in and around that, uh, you know, that high oat inclusion region around the Narrage and Pingley type area. Um, as I said, it's a fungal disease. Um, it's a seed and stubble-borne disease, and it really is favoured by those sort of um, damp, cool winter conditions. Just to give you an idea of, of, we don't really know what the implications are for Western Australia, but just to give you an idea of how important this disease can be, um, we do, we were involved with some, some of our Victorian colleagues in a, a oat and hay project uh, funded by AgriFutures. And in the surveillance component of that project, um, they would suggest that uh, red leather leaf is the most common and damaging disease of oats in that southeastern uh, portion of, uh, um, of Australia. And in their surveillance, 90% you know, of the high rainfall zone oat crops in Victoria had red leather leaf. So pretty much we're talking about a similar sort of level of disease as we see with septoria. Has um, significant reductions in grain yield in both in grain and hay. So um, something that we're going to be keeping an eye on, and we're certainly interested to hear about any um, suspected uh, occurrences of that disease this year. In barley, we've talked about spot form net blotch, um, uniformly uh, distributed across, across Western Australia. A couple of uh, diseases that we're keeping an eye on or, or, or are increasing, one is scald, um, and certainly in the Albany and uh, Esperance port zones, there was about, I don't know, 10% of crops uh, reported having scald. Um, so something, if we're growing a variety that we know has a weakness for scald, um, certainly it's a disease that if it's present in the crop, it needs to be managed uh, actively. Uh, the other disease that is, that is certainly a stubble-borne disease that is certainly established again in the, in the southern regions is net form, net blotch. Um, basically, 100% of the paddocks that we surveyed in our spring survey had net form, net blotch present in them. A couple of maybe explanations for that. One is um, the emergence of, uh, several years ago, but the establishment of, of this uh, Oxford uh, pathotype of net form, net blotch, which has you know, quite a virulence on quite a number of varieties. And the susceptibility, particularly of planet, so it's SVS to that pathotype, and planet is obviously fairly dominant in those southern regions. And so um, it's no surprise that we're seeing um, net form, net blotch establishing as, as a disease needing uh, management in that zone. Um, and we would suggest that, uh, that it will continue to be an issue um, whilst a variety like planet dominates the, the landscape in that area. Just a reminder, obviously, that both net form, net blotch and spot form, net blotch, um, there are issues associated with reducer sensitivity or, um, or resistance to DMI fungicides. And certainly in spot form net, blot, net blotch, there's a significant concern about uh, uh, mutations for uh, reduced sensitivity or resistance to um, SDHI fungicides. So certainly we need to be aware of the risks associated with fungicide resistance uh, with some of those barley diseases. Canola, now this is not my necessarily my area of expertise, but I do want to briefly touch on, on, on some canola issues, and Kira is going to cover off on sclerotinia. I briefly wanted to talk about uh, the fact that we know that the canola area last year increased quite dramatically, about a 25% increase in, in the area of canola. We know that blackleg is a stubble-borne disease, um, so we know that there's obviously going to be just a bit more canola uh, stubble out there and this year there's no indication that the area of canola has reduced so therefore we're facing a circumstance in which canola crops this year are likely to be um, you know closer to um, stubble from last year. Blackleg obviously can cause two, two uh, major concerns there's the crown canker issue 
and the upper canopy infection issue. Earlier sown crops are likely to uh, be, have a greater exposure to that upper canopy infection. But um, the, the, the issue I wanted to briefly touch on is the crown canker issue. What we know is that um, spores released from stubble, if they, um, if they uh, sort of are coming across a crop at that seedling stage, then that's the, that's the, uh, the situation that predisposes a crop to risk of crown canker. DPIRD produces these risk maps um, you know, during the start of the, the growing season. And this is the most recent one for black leg spore shower risk forecast. This was produced on Tuesday of this week. Um, and really it's talking about the risk of, uh, if you're sowing a crop at the moment, what's the risk of, it, of that crop being exposed to uh, uh, spores being produced on stubble? What we can see is that actually across that southern zone and that great southern zone, that recent April rainfall has obviously been very favourable for maturation of spores. And so a lot of crops that are being sown recently or at this time uh, are likely to be uh, receiving spore showers in that susceptible seedling stage, that sort of you know, up to six to eight leaf stage. So if you're growing a susceptible variety, maybe if you uh, weren't able to use a, a, an, a seeding uh, fungicide or you're in a circumstance where a crop is on or adjacent to stubble, um, then there could be an elevated risk of crown canker in those crops. Um, the the Black, Man, Black Leg Management app, Black Leg CM, is available and it's a, it's a tool that's designed to assist in making decisions about the best and most profitable management strategy for um, black leg and whether or not there may be uh, opportunity or requirement for a fungicide application, foliar fungicide application in that to those seedling crops. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna briefly talk about wheat. Not a lot to talk about in wheat, except for I just wanted to make a point about um, that, uh, that we saw several samples last year of abiotic or physiological symptoms um, occurring in wheat. And this is a picture of some kinsai wheat from Franklin. I really guess the point is that uh, diagnosis of disease is pretty important before you're spending money on treatment um, because we had, as I said, we had several samples come in last year that turned out not to be disease, although they looked quite a lot like, in this case, uh, Nodorum blotch. So key messages, basically stubborn diseases were were you know, common last year and will continue to be an issue for 2022. Kira will talk about sclerot sclerotinia. Increased canola area probably will, will predispose towards increased black leg risk. Early sowing um, opportunities, we know do increases the impact of diseases across the spectrum, um, but certainly exposes the upper portion of plants to, to disease favorable conditions. And we really are interested for people to look, be on the lookout for watch, to watch out for red leather leaf. Uh, thank you, and I'll pass on to Kira to, to talk about uh, sclerotinia. So uh, I'm going to be talking about sclerotinia in lupins and canola. As Jeff said, the risk is high this season, and so there's some considerations for management that I'd like to share with you. So sclerotinia sclerotiorum is the same um, pathogen that infects broadleaf crops and pastures like lupins and canola. And the yield loss in canola is um, primarily associated with the main stem infection that you can see here on the right, while in lupins it's from pod infection, um, usually on the main spike. And you can see these um, black fruiting bodies, they're the sclerotes that carry the disease over between seasons. And it's very hard to predict um, when this disease is going to be a problem and it's quite challenging to manage. So these sclerotia, these um, fungal inoculum of the pathogen is present across all um, wheat, uh, across the whole wheat belt. And it's been increasing in recent years in canola and um, gradually becoming a significant issue in lupins. So with increasing area sown to canola, like Jeff said, there's increased risk of crops being sown adjacent to or infected paddocks that have these um, sclerotes sitting in the soil waiting to um, spread the disease. So a lot of the um, lupin observations I'm going to be showing today are from the sclerotinia management project that we have uh, funded by GRDC and it's a collaboration between DPIRD, Mingyu Irwin Group and CCDM. And last year was the first year of this project which goes for four years and um, 
we think that with the increased incidence of sclerotinia in canola, um, then it's in the system and it's um, becoming a big issue in lupins because they're growing in close rotation with canola. Um, so as Jeff said, we saw a lot of basal infection in lupins uh, last year in the Geraldton Port Zone and in parts of Kwanana North, and you can see the symptoms here. And then when we pulled the plants up, you could see it at the base of the stem. And a lot of these places in um, the Kwanana North area hadn't seen sclerotinia even in their canola since 2016. So it was a bit of a um, yeah, wake up call for them that the sclerotes were, were sitting there waiting for the perfect weather conditions to come up. So in our trials that we had last year, we found that foliar fungicides applied during flowering and early pot emergence to lupins did not reduce this basal infection. And it's probably because it's occurring below ground level and um, the fungicides can't um, reach it. So um, I'm not gonna be talking about basal infection for the rest of the presentation, but I just wanted to let you know that we're expanding the project this year with extra funding from GRDC and in kind from our collaborators um, to investigate basal infection and how it occurs and if there is any strategies we could do to um, reduce it. So incidence of sclerotinia last year was high in the Geraldton Port Zone, as Jeff said, and many growers in the Geraldton Port Zone had to grade sclerotia out of their grain. Um, this indicates there's a lot of disease inoculum likely being added to the farming systems, particularly after last year. So the sclerotinia disease cycle everyone is um, probably familiar with, but there are three trigger points that require that are required to happen, and they all require specific weather conditions, which um, you know don't happen every season. So that makes it hard to predict. But the disease most, is mostly a problem in wet years where you get the germination of sclerotia early, and then um, infection of the petals. So the apathies you need to be present when the crop is flowering and then infection in the crop canopy. So these are obviously pictures of canola, but we believe it applies to lupins the same. So if seasonal conditions are favourable this year, then um, it's likely to continue to be a problem, sclerotinia in areas where it was in recent years. So these are the apothecia that form from sclerotia, and you can see that they are, um, can be very um, rigorous and in increasing areas sown to canola plus recent sclerotinia infection means there's likely to be a lot of these sclerotia in the soil. Unfortunately for us, they can survive and germinate for multiple times over at least five years, if not longer. And that's what um, Dean Galloway, who manages the manage the modeling disease modeling project said, was that last year in um, scleric depots, they were seeing sclerotia germinating from, they had been formed in 2016 and they had um, germinated since then, but they were still germinating last year. So that's, um, yeah, a real big warning that there is a lot of risk from sclerotinia from these sclerotes in the system. So you should plan to manage sclerotinia risk. And the way to look at this is to consider the paddock history, which is a big factor as to whether you've got these sclerotia in your system. Um, there's also a predictor B test and you can look for apothecia, but believe me, they're very hard to find. And then during the growing season, you determine your risk by walking into the paddock and checking the crop canopy conditions, uh, looking at density, uh, yield potential, and what the weather's been like. And we'll talk a bit about that more. And then the last part of the puzzle piece is obviously to consider what management strategies you could use. And I'll mention sclerotinia CM. So what we found in lupin crops in our project so far is that lupin crops that develop significant levels of sclerotinia have several factors in common. And this is paddocks that have had sclerotinia in the last few years, loamy soil types as opposed to sandy ones, a low protected part of the landscape, and generally dense crops with early canopy closure and good yield potential as pictured this high risk um, crop. And that other picture is of another part of the paddock so you can see that even within the same paddock the risk can change so it's all about um, prioritizing parts of the paddock that are at risk um, maybe the whole paddock won't be at risk of getting sclerotinia but certainly um, this part with the dense canopy cover would so what we saw in our Geraldton time of sowing trial in 2021 was that early 
time of sowing um, plots had significantly more disease and earlier than the later time of sowing. So that's something to consider this year because I know there's a lot of lupins going in early, particularly in the Gerald and Port Zone. And in canola, the similar to um, looking at the density in lupins, this is part of the Sclerotinia CM app where you look for wet canopy days. It asks you to enter wet canopy days. And, and that's a, a factor of dense, bulky crops with good canopy cover. When you walk out into them, um, you get wet pants. And so there's no substitute really for experience. Get out there and walk through your crop and see if your pants get wet in different conditions or different parts of the day. So there's a higher risk, obviously, from crops um, that have continuous wet canopy days, they're going to be at higher risk of sclerotinia infection. So what can you do about it? Well, sclerotinia management um, strategies, there are some cultural um, activities that you can do, and then there's fungicide ones. And just very quickly, crop rotation is a big one because it's obviously more and more canola being grown is um, a host of the disease and spreading sclerotia through the system. So if you can grow more cereals in rotation, that would be good, or at least try and separate the um, places where you grew canola or lupins last year if they were infected and try and grow um, this year's a bit further away because the spores can spread from the sclerotia when they germinate. Then using clean seed and, as I said earlier, sown crops might need to be prioritised in case they are at higher risk of disease. And then something we're looking at this year in our project with lupins is reduced seeding rates might increase the airflow through the canopy so that's something um, we're going to be considering with growers at a large scale and also in our small plot trial finally um foliar fungicide application is a um yeah one that everybody thinks of when they think of um, managing disease but this is just one part of the puzzle so there are now um products registered in lupins and um just basically use something that's registered at a high water rate to get good penetration and preferably after a rainfall event as fungicides work better if um, you put them on before significant infection occurs. Last year we saw a lot of disease in the Geraldton Port Zone developing in August and um, yeah it was too late by the time a lot of girls put um, a fungicide on. So in canola you can use the Sclerotin CM app which is a great app developed through the Disease Modelling Project and the National Canola Pathology Program. So you can download that to your iPad and it's really good for working out if you should spray or not. And then you can also use it for things like comparing the profitability of different timings, different products, um, which, which paddocks to prioritise. And then looking at things like determining the value of a second spray if it's a um, season that has a wet spring um, in likely, or you've got a really um, high disease load. So as I said before, it's important not to overuse fungicides. So you can use sclerotin ECM to um, determine it, whether it's actually worthwhile if it's necessary to apply fungicides because it, in a lot of um, situations it might not be. For lupins, this is um, my final slide. Well, we've been doing research on lupins and so far we've found that sclerotin and lupins should be managed differently to that in canola and that um, there isn't a disease management tool yet for lupins, but if the crops at high risk, as I showed you those pictures of a high risk kind of canopy, um, and there's ongoing um, outlook for, for moist and humid weather conditions, and you've had sclerotin here before, then um, fungicide application may be profitable, and you should aim it at late flowering or full to late flowering on the main spike. And there are lots of products registered in Lupin now. One's registered for sclerotin here, and the others are just registered in Lupin, but they can all be used. And so far we've seen yield responses of four to six percent were common, but um, not guaranteed. But if you have a wet spring and um, if it's a really favorable year like last year, you're more likely to get a yield response. So I'll hand um, over to Cindy now for any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kira, for that. And that brings us to the question and answer session of our webinar. Uh, we have had one question come in. And Jeff, I think this might go to you. Are you expecting um, oat leaf rust to be an issue this season? Um, so, Cindy, I did say that. And so, look, uh, in in area, I would say that there would be um, 
uh, inoculum persisting, maybe if there's been persisting area of wild oats. What I would suggest is if there's areas where wild oats have got a, got a head start on the crop, then um, then I would think that, that that might be a risk. But in some of that oat uh, area, and certainly Sydney down around your part of the world, I imagine it's still quite dry and probably the long, the hot, dry summer and then the persisting dryness in some of those oat areas means that we're probably not getting the amount of wild oats along the roadside and things that we might have last year. And so maybe it's a reduced risk this year. Okay, very good. And I'm just gonna do a quick check. Um, I don't think we have any other questions coming in, um, but that is fine because I'm just gonna put up on the screen the present, our presenters contact details for the, in case you think of a question after this webinar, um, please feel free to contact Jeff and Kira. And we will be circulating the slides I'm recording. And I'd just like to finish off the webinar today by saying that uh, we are very keen, the PestFax WA team, to know what plant diseases and insects you are finding. Um, please feel free to use our app. We are, do have a new app coming out shortly, so watch this space, or feel free to email the team. And in return, uh, we will give you a free diagnosis and at times even a management, some management advice. We do regularly put post updates on Twitter, um, PESFAX WA tweets, and just to say what reports we're receiving so that you know what is being found across the WA Grain Belt. So keep an eye out for us on Twitter. And again, I'd just like to thank uh, GIDC and DPED for funding this webinar under the RPM for Grains project. So I'd just like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. I'd like to say also a very big thank you to Jeff and Kira for presenting and for Jeanette Pratt for co-hosting in the background. And we'll say goodbye for now, but we hope that you'll have a, a great day and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.